Right now, we're going to welcome our next live guest this morning. We've got Michael Farlikas from uh, CEO of E2 Open with us today, talking a little bit about using visibility tools during the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Michael, thank you for joining us this morning. Hello, how are you? Good to see you. We're doing great, and we appreciate you being with us on the show today. Before we get into our conversation today, give us a little bit of background about E2 Open and what you guys do in the visibility space. Sure. So E2 Open is an end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain management software platform, and we help customers uh, from one end of the supply chain, which is supply, all the way to the other, which is fulfillment through sales and everything in between. So that would include uh, manufacturing collaboration, global trade management, obviously visibility, transportation management, and then also um, helping customers in the channel and retail. So think of uh, a large brand owner and all of their needs for supply chain in one integrated uh, platform where we connect the uh, their partners and outside world to their systems. Uh, Most of what we are is a, a very large networked business. We have over a half a million connected parties to our, to our platform. We're a publicly traded company and we focus on uh, the world's largest um, companies across all industries. And Michael, I mean, this is, I think, definitely timely and needed for what we're seeing right now. Can you talk to us about how this integrates or really helps support um, some of the difficulties that we're seeing with especially some of the Russia-Ukraine conflicts right now? Yeah, listen, it's a terrible situation. You know, I think all of us thought those those things were over a long time ago, but obviously not. So we all have to be vigilant. Um, but how we help our customers most right now is through our global trade management solution. Um, we have you know hundreds to thousands of customers on that solution, and what that solution does is it collects every you know day, every hour, information that government agencies publish about trade, what they can ship to whom, when they can ship it, what they can't ship, and all of these. And, that, and we, we take that information and we codify it, and then we publish that every single day into the actual systems our customers use. So they can just operate their business with confidence that they get they have the latest and greatest information about what all, you know, every country in the world is saying they can and can't do. And that obviously changes daily. And with this crisis, um, what we've seen obviously is a, a, lot, a very rapid increase in sanctions and also rules and what people, companies can and can't do. So we've been um, really literally updating um, our library um, daily and publishing that to our customers. So our big customers that use our global trade management system can literally just run their business. Our system will, you know, as a part of their workflow, you know, deny what they can and can't do. So companies don't have to really change anything on their hand. We take all that responsibility on and we collect that information from virtually every country in the world um, every single day. So when we see government sanctions, oftentimes companies have to pivot pretty quickly in order to comply with those government sanctions coming from the top down. But recently, and specifically with this conflict, we're seeing a lot of companies choose to self-sanction and choose to kind of put up this position where they're saying, okay, we're going to pull out of Russia and keep our assets out of there and everything just is, is almost taking a political stance in the issue. Can you talk a little bit about the differences in response time from companies and from even the global trade ecosystem when it comes from government sanctions? sanctions versus companies choosing to self-sanction? Is, is there a difference in how groups need to react to their trade st trade strategy when it's coming from a government versus when it's coming from an individual company? It, it really doesn't matter where what the source of the, of the change is. This is all a matter of compliance. And the compliance can come from, as you mentioned, government agencies it also, or trade groups even, or it could come from your own compliance. So if you're the CEO of a large company, you make a decision on what you want to do. That has to be, you know, executed in some system so that the daily work that happens across a big enterprise happens in compliance with, you know, whatever the decisions are. So for people that have a sophisticated, you know, platform like ours, um, they, that happens kind of automatically on the government side of it. So anything that go any government around the world says would literally be updated um, in a 24-hour basis. And then uh, that obviously would, would play right into if a CEO decided to change something the system would also be able to be updated by the by the users to reflect that. So, from a from a systems and execution perspective, um, that that really is no difference if it comes from internally from a company or from um, you know an outside agency or or a government. But what is remarkable though is um, the kind of the stance that you know many companies have taken, including ours, um, in terms of how you know we're dealing with with this situation. You know, what part of our business is we, we do bookings uh, for ocean freight and we're supportive of our partners in the ocean liners who all decided to 
not book freight except for humanitarian food products um, to these, the uh, to Russia and Belarus, which were obviously very supportive of that. And Michael, uh, we're a big fan of daily updated data here. Um, yeah. When you're looking at um, individuals within the logistics community, what are some of the ways that they can mitigate some of these disruptions that we're seeing that's happening right now? Yeah, it goes back to kind of what we've been talking a lot about. And this is, you know, these volatile uh, situations haven't really been new for the past three or four years. There's been a lot of, you know, really pretty rapid changes. And for us and how we think about it, um, it's about building agility into your overall supply network and supply chains. Um, that, that's not a simple task to, that happens overnight, but um, our, the best clients we have are the ones that have been thoughtful about building resiliency, which really means agility and diversity um, into their entire supply network. And that means being thoughtful about where you, you know, who your partners are, how concentrated they are to a region or to an industry type, to a country, and then building diversification into your supply base and all your partners. And then that's part of the, of the solution. The other part is you have to be able to automatically on the fly change in a very rapid amount of time. That gives you the agility to adapt. Um, and that's where your know, platforms and systems really come into play because you have to be able to decide what you want to do and execute that within a matter of you know, days or weeks, not months. So the, the sum is you have to build more agility into your architecture um, so that you can adapt to these you know, changes that are seemingly happening all the time. And, and that means you have to have you know, sophisticated systems to allow you to make those trade-offs and execute them you know, from, uh, from one place and then have the system just come operate. Most of you know, your, your, your viewers and our customers are outsourced the majority of the activities that they do in the entire supply chain spectrum. So in that sense, you have to be able to connect to them live and be able to change almost daily what your perspective is. So you need a different kind of system architecture to do that. So large scale disruptive events like this one, like COVID-19, like everything that's happened in the last two years in our industry really are kind of the proof of the use case for systems like E2Open. Can you talk a little bit about how large scale disruptive events maybe highlight a op an opportunity, I would call it, for platforms like yours? And if your platform has seen any developments after the onset of large scale disruptive events, is have these things made you guys better in any way? Well, it made us better because we have to react for our customers. So we build more capabilities to do that. That's for sure. Um, it, and it really started for us at the advent of the, you know, the tariffs and the trade wars, um, you know, even pre-COVID. Because it, it, before that, most companies, you know, supply chains were global, but they're fairly static. They kind of could rely on a very stable approach and they optimize that one, you know, approach and they leaned it out as much as possible. And trade wars really pretty abruptly, abruptly said, Maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should need to have different regions so I can switch from time to time based on what's happening in the world. COVID exacerbated that, you know, with very massive demand um, uh, shifts and um, disruptions, and then also supply disruptions simultaneously. That's never really happened in our world. So the companies have kind of thoughtfully said, if, if I can understand what's happening in the future through better demand sensing, and I can be more reactive or have a more agility on the other side, which is I can use different parts of my network almost immediately, that makes me more agile. So how that's translated for our business is that these decisions are becoming a lot less about the, the point leader, um, head of transportation, head of planning, and much more about the C level and even board level, where they're saying, I need to holistically think about a very you know agile supply chain. Um, and that's that's been super helpful for, for our business in the past two years. Michael, you bring up a lot of great points, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. If people want to learn a little bit more about your company, about E2Open, where can they go to? I'll go to our, our website, E2Open.com, and my name's on there. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk to anybody. Good stuff, Michael. Thank you so much, and have a great weekend. Have a great day. Thank you.